that's okay i can hear you can you hear me yes you're hearing me now yes wow <laughs> brilliant you know, oh, wow. <laughs> and, and the thing is if it doesn't work you know i'm soldering iron and i wouldn't know what to do with it anyway yeah they can be very temperamental i i mean i've been using zoom and all sorts of video conferencing for the last couple of years but every now and then there is this little bug and there's well, nothing I, you can do zoom has been pretty good you know it's been the one that works most reliably for me and and i've done a number of podcasts now on you know, zencaster and google hangouts and and skype and god knows what and each one is a little different. It's just, I long for the days of the phone where you could just you dial it and, and somebody would, you may not be old enough to remember that kind of phone, but uh, oh, I really miss it. <laughs> but you know what, it's, 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 it's very interesting because I, even though I'm, you know, we're, we're different generation, but I, I hate emails. I hate texts. Uh, I crave uh, calling people. And, what in in what i do very often people don't like phone calls because they like some sort of trace of what they said they want to have some sort of evidence of what was said in the meeting or in the conversation and i uh i don't like it i prefer to hear someone's voice you know because um, from 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 person's voice you can you can hear emotions and feelings and whether they're angry with you uh, yeah, I, I hate texts, especially texts. I got in, in trouble so many times with sending someone a stupid, silly one sentence text and they, you know, got it the wrong way. <laughs> uh, no, I you know they, they, you get a lot more bandwidth with voice, of course, and because you get the tone and into even more bandwidth, you know, because you, you can see the kids in the background or the dog or whatever. So, you, you know, you, you, get a, yeah. you get a much better sense. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and obviously, ten, what, what's ten times better is actually face-to-face -face interaction, and uh, I, I, I crave it even more these days. I haven't seen my family for a long time. They live in Poland. I live in the UK, so it's been it's been pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. the whole yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, well, uh, it's good afternoon because it's, it's good evening here. Uh, I actually was quite surprised that it's only four hours difference. Well, it's going to be five hours shortly because of daylight savings time. We've flipped to the daylight savings time, but you haven't yet. Okay, okay. But it, it's it's so strange because the distance is so vast, and even crossing the English Channel, we move one hour. It, it's strange. <laughs> well, the, well, the circumference of the Earth is twenty four thousand miles, roughly. So every thousand miles should be an hour. But um, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Exactly, exactly. Who knows? Uh, okay, so before we kick off with 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 some questions and uh, in depth conversation about your chair and Core the three sixty, could you uh, very quickly introduce yourself to to uh, viewers and listeners? Uh, what you do, who you are, uh, and then I'll introduce myself to you because uh, you don't know me either. <laughs> Hi, my name is Turner Osler. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of Vermont in the Department of Surgery. I was a career trauma surgeon for 25 years, and I got a master's in biostatistics and a grant from the NIH for a few million dollars. And I spent the next decade researching um, the effectiveness of trauma centers and trauma care, doing statistical modeling and trying to figure out which trauma centers were having the best results and which trauma centers were having less success so that the you know the laggards could learn from the best and we could you know all help each other and um so you know i was quite comfortably ensconced as a really a trauma epidemiologist and i was sitting around writing code a lot so um so finally my back bothered me so much I, I i thought somebody has to do something and i stumbled onto the entrepreneur track which is uh where i've been for the last few years it's a uh, it's, it's not at all what I expected to be doing when I'm 70 years old, but uh, life is what happens when you when you're not looking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's actually really really interesting the way 
what you do and what I do overlap because I do something completely different. Um, I, I'm a teacher by trade, so I've got a degree in English philology, <laughs> nothing to do with ergonomics and you know, uh, back pain, etc. Uh, and when I moved to uh, United Kingdom, I started working as a moving and handling trainer. Uh, so do you, have you got moving and handling uh, specialist in, in the United States? Well, um, we have people who talk about this stuff at, ergon at academic ergonomics conferences, but if you were to go to the, uh, if you were to try and look up a moving and handling specialist, um, you'd have to look for a while because we don't think we have that clear delineation. We have ergonomists who, you know, are supposed to be able to help businesses get things flowing better in using the human component. Um, so that in, in this country, I guess you'd go to an ergonomist and hope to find some subspecialist in moving and handling. So, so it, here in UK, it, it's a quite developed discipline. It, it's a recognized certification and uh, uh, it's, it's something that's got a little bit of occupational therapist, physiotherapist, ergonomist. Uh, so my main role is to uh, assess people's mobility. Uh, I also do a lot of teaching as well. So I train nurses, doctors, carers, how to uh, move people in a safe way. Uh, however, recently, about two, three years ago, uh, the type of assessment that was added to my responsibilities was DSE assessment. So DSE is a display and screen equipment regulations. Mm -hmm. It's relatively new uh, law uh, that covers ergonomic approach to your workstation. So things like ergonomic chairs, ergonomic IT equipment, etc., etc. So my role uh, was to assess my colleagues and their workstations, advise uh, advise them of, on you know what sort of chair height of screen distance from the scene, etc. So I'm relatively new to to this area. However, I am I am extremely passionate about it, and I've been doing loads and loads of research. And I'm guessing that's why the, the, the two disciplines over overlap. That, that's how uh, I've been experimenting with uh, active chairs for a long, long time. And uh, when uh, I think the lady's name is, was was it Jessica, the lady who contacted me. Uh -huh. Yes, the, uh, the, the yeah, so when I when I when I looked you up when I when I started uh, stalking you uh, online, uh, looking through your social media and you know your the TED talk, uh, I was I was so so impressed. And uh, actually, I'm sitting on your chair at the moment, and I've been using it for about a week or so. I filmed and un uh, the uh, unboxing video, which I'm going to post on YouTube as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm fighting over this chair with my wife. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, um, this is a lot, and sometimes the simplest thing is to get another one. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, so we know who we are. Uh, so let's let's go to to the first first question. So obviously, it it would be impossible not to talk about COVID nineteen because even in the area of active chairs and ergonomics, it has caused chaos really uh, so in in the uk hundreds of thousands of millions of people were basically told if you can work from home go home uh, set up whatever you can in the corner there of your bedroom conservatory you know landing and work from home was this the same in uh, in the united states yes um you know people were um summarily uh, dismissed um, and with good reason I, I i'm part of a COVID research group here at the university of vermont i'm, you know, I'm still an emeritus professor and i, I help with the math and experimental design and um, research as we uh, look more deeply into COVID. so I, I know this i know this literature pretty well um, but anyway it was a it was a seismic shift for everyone to suddenly go home work from home and you know, it wasn't clear how long it was going to be for most people. Those of us in the game were pretty sure it would be at least a year, probably more. Um, 
And so, um, because most people didn't anticipate it would be a long-term thing, there were a lot of people, you know, working all day from bed or at the kitchen table or, you know, sitting on the couch or this or that. And, um, and by and large, it didn't go well. Um, we don't have real research on this because you know, it wasn't a planned experiment. And nobody was ready for this massive shift of everybody working from home. But because I'm, I'm like the CEO of a little company that makes the chair that we sent here, um, you know, we get lots and lots of emails saying, you know, I, I, I have to do something. I just, I just can't sit on this kitchen chair or on my couch or in my bed any longer. And companies in the United States, um, you know, kind of, the, the agile ones, you know, kind of caught on right away. And for example, Google said, okay, fine, we're going to give every employee a, a budget of I think $2,000 to upgrade their home office so that they, you know, will be in, in uh, you know, will be able to work effectively for us. You know, it, it, I mean, it's not kindness. It's, it's just, it's just, it's just good business, right? To make sure your employees can work. So, um, somehow we got on a mailing list inside of Google as like the, the best year that, you know, people at Google had seen. And, you know, within, within weeks, we got hundreds and hundreds of orders from, from the 54 cities that have Google, uh, have Google offices scattered across North America. So, um, yeah, you know, so initially there was chaos, but some businesses that were agile were able to harness the chaos and say, okay, this is a good opportunity to let our employees vote for what kind of stuff they want. And so, you know, we were part of the massive home upgrade here in the United States, which, which uh, of course, we didn't anticipate. So we were scrambling to, you know, get enough chairs out of the warehouse to keep the Google crowd happy. But it all worked out pretty well for everybody. I think so too. I think so too. I think because I think next week we'll have one year anniversary of, of the first lockdown, mm -hmm. and I think we, uh, well, some companies they do some surveys and they uh, they actually came up with some numbers. So I can I can I can give you a couple of uh, statistics. So thirty eight percent of workers feel stressed and anxious, and that's uh, that's after they well you basically enforced homeworking. Uh, 32 feel lonely and isolated, but what's what's really interesting, 27% have a stiff neck and 26% a sore or aching back. But what was really fascinating, that only 49% uh, have a proper home workstation, 10% admit to working from their sofa, 5% from, <laughs> from their bed, and 3% on the floor. Right, and these are people who are admitting it, you know, God knows what... Yeah. And <laughs> And I, and I hope you I hope you had the, the you know the, the good manners not to ask how many people are working from their bathroom. <laughs> At least it, it's a, it's sitting. <laughs> uh, but I, I have to say that I'm I'm quite impressed with how UK prepared and how they reacted because my my budget was immediately increased and I was given extra money for extra let's say ergonomic. Uh, chairs, but I purchased loads of uh, things like you know, vertical mice, uh, loads of uh, ergonomic keyboards, footrests. Uh, I've been invited to everyone's home to have a look at their environment and you know advise them of you know the setup, the layout. Uh, and talking to my friends, it's it's the same everywhere in the UK. Uh, so the, obviously there is money, and I think companies see it as as an investment, really. Just a good and I and I think what I'm, I'm really hoping that at the end of this we can come out and start this sort of hybrid working, so people can actually choose. Well, actually, I I don't like working from from home. I prefer office environment. It, it gives me more productivity. And some people will say, well, actually, I don't mind. Uh, I. I ended up doing the same sort of amount of work as I normally would have done in the office. And I can, you know, spend some time with my children. Uh, and I love the flexibility. So uh, giving people choice to what they want to do, I think will be a massive, massive benefit from this. And obviously, you know, uh, it's good business for you as well. Right, no, uh, you know, we, uh, as the pandemic came at us like a tsunami, um, because I'm, in the business, um, tell that it was going to be a catastrophe, and I 
I briefly considered, you know, just kind of shifting our little uh, startup company into hybrid mode because it was going to be uh, a mess. Um, but um, because we've got a handful of twenty-something gig workers that would be suddenly, you know, without uh, without a paycheck, I thought we should just white knuckle it and just do the best we can. And I was shocked to find, you know, our sales doubled and then doubled again because everybody at home, you know, suddenly. You know, suddenly they needed to sit someplace all day long, and, and our chairs really kind of took off. And it's interesting that we were having trouble penetrating into real offices. You know, we've, I've been to, you know, office wellness conferences, and I've pitched to, you know, Boeing and Cisco and really big companies. And, and the HR people were, yeah, no, this is great. It'd be terrific. You know, our, our, our people would stop having back pain. How great would that be? You know, well, so we'd set up some chairs. and. And then uh, we ran smack into the into the ergonomic boxes who said, this chair doesn't have a back. And so no one could possibly sit on it all day long. <laughs> and, and so we were just off the menu. I, I said, you know, I'm a 70-year-old coot, and somehow I managed to sit on one all day. It can't be that no one can sit, because the <laughs> But the ergonomists are, are quite certain of themselves, which, um, which guarantees that they will be wrong. Right? If you can't if you can't evolve, then your views will become uh, wrong and then irrelevant. Absolutely, yeah, you're, you're you're absolutely right, and I and I think there is there is some sort of resistance because uh, because I as I said I I. I I did a lot of research around ergonomic chairs and then sitting and posture, and it, it's it's so strange because you've been around for some time now as 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 a designer. Mm -hmm. So and obviously you came up to this conclusion that yeah, 90, 90, 90 degrees angle sitting uh, posture is not correct. However, every I mean everywhere I go, everywhere I Google. It still comes up as the best position, and it's not only, you know, some sort of rogue ergonomists. It's it's people that I usually trust, people that I companies that I buy equipment from, people that I take advice from on things like ergonomics. Uh, what what do you think is the reason for this? Why this sort of reluctance to to, to change? Well, you know. Well as a researcher, you know, my first question is, where did the 90-90-90 idea even come from, right? I mean, it's not the only set of, you can imagine lots of different angles, right? Why 90-90-90? And doesn't it seem odd that the best angle for the foot is exactly equal to the best angle for the knee, is exactly equal to the best angle for the knee? Isn't that, isn't that surprising in some way? I mean, Nature is full of you know curves and and elegance and the idea that it would be I mean well you know you have to be a little suspicious that that shape is the easiest one to make so that's one thing but um, people who are excellent researchers and have thought about this longer than I have have written entire books on this kind of thing. Uh, and you know there are there are entire books that look at the idea of posture, and it seems like in the 1800s, uh, philosophers were trying to show that humans were different and better than animals, and so because humans had an upright posture, that was the sort of thing that allowed us to dominate and torture all other species, um, and so. Having proper posture became uh, part of the the gig for being a, a proper person, and so you know there were exercises that were invented to make children sit in particular ways, and and you know women came in for some of the some of the harshest sorts of punishments. You know there were there were really extraordinary devices that were you know invented to try and force them into. Know, postures that were profoundly abnormal, but um, deemed uh, you know appropriate or proper. So, so the whole idea of ninety 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 kind of comes from more a moralistic tradition than any kind of anatomic or physiologic 
position. We know, for example, that the hip doesn't flex to 90 degrees. Now, the hip only flexes to 60 or 70 degrees. And by the time you bring the femur up parallel to the floor, you've lost your lumbar lordosis because, and the only way to get your lumbar lordosis back is to drop your knees so that the psoas pulls on L1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and reestablishes the normal, you know, hollow back of a, of a normal person. If you put somebody in the 90, 90, 90 chair and look at them, you know, now they're like this. And the ergonomists look at that and say, no, that can't be right, right? That, that's, that's not right. So let's do this. Let's put in lumbar support and just, you know, just push on the lumbar vertebrae and put something that, that looks like, you know, what would stand by. But of course, no one can sit like that for more than about two minutes. So everybody retreat, you know, wiggles away from the lumbar support because, you know, it's, it's terrible. And yet, it's the standard. I mean, if you, if you look, well, you look. Well, you, well I, I've been guilty of providing some lumbar support for my colleagues. And you know what? The funny thing is, they love it. <laughs> Well, they, 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 they are thankful, they, they appreciate, they say, oh, it, it, it feels so much better. I don't really believe, believe them because it just didn't look right, it didn't feel right. But no, that's and, what and they asked for. And if you surreptitiously leave a video camera to see what happens after you leave, I guarantee you they're not going to be sitting like you left them. <laughs> I guarantee it. Um, it's, it. You know what? It's. It feels like it's 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 an old ancient concept of this 1990 90. Uh, all the chairs look the same, and it's just for the furniture industry for you know designers. It's just too difficult of a job to change people's this sort of preconceived notion of what a chair is. Because no, no, and, and that preconceived notion was supplied by the by the chair industry. I had a very interesting. I was at an academic ergonomics conference in um, Ergo, Ergo Expo in um, Las Vegas two years ago, back when you had conferences. And I met a very interesting guy who had been on the design team of the Herman Miller Aeron Chair, 1994, over 8 million of them sold. I mean, they, they, they've sold a lot of these chairs here in the United States and I expect in Europe as well. And we had a very animated conversation, you know, because he was a god in the world of chair design. You know, he had groupies following him around. The I'm like a nobody, you know, emeritus professor from the University of Vermont. Kind of loud. I got no business being in Vegas. So, but we had a, a spirited conversation. He's talking about you know, chair design and, and this and that. I'm talking about anatomy and physiology and ology and all these other ologies. And, <clears throat> and we were just like from two different, uh, you know, two different planets. Huh? But it was, but he's a very smart guy. And, uh, you know, so we, we swapped email addresses. I go back to Burlington, Vermont, and I find an email waiting for me. And he says, I feel terrible. I've spent my life trying to make chairs so comfortable, no one would want to get up. And now you're telling me that sitting slouched all day is terrible for people's posture back pain and for their overall health. But what do you want me to do? I cannot sit in the chair unless it has lumbar support. And I thought, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you know, this problem is going to be harder than I thought because there's this immense legacy problem where the ch big chair has been pushing this idea for at least 50 years, maybe 100 years. And they cannot walk it back. They've got billions of ad dollars kind of pushing this idea. And, you know, they can't, they can't get out ahead of their people or they'll, they won't be able to sell chairs. So, you know, it came to me in this kind of flash that you know, we're not trying to make a better chair or a different chair. We are trying to overturn the idea of what a chair is, you know. All that stuff that you've been told, backrest, footrest, headrest, armrest. Lumbar support? No, it's not. Uh -uh. No, you know, your, your, your best support is your internal ergonomics. You know, your skeleton you know, is designed and built over 4 billion years, if you count all the prototypes, and has been in daily use for 3 million years. It's perfect. I know this. I took it apart in the anatomy lab. I put it back together in the OR. You know, 
And the fact that our, our spines fail 80% of us in the Western world, is that really the spine's fault or is it how we're using it? And I think that the, you know, the, the terrible idea we have about how we should sit has been catastrophic. Hundred billion dollars a year for back pain in the United States every year. The average business spends three hundred and fifty dollars per year per employee on back pain. How is that even possible? Chiropractors, MDs, visits, missed work, productivity because of back pain, back surgery, and then back surgery gone wrong. I mean, it gets expensive very fast, and it's okay. the population. So you know. It's an immense problem. It, it basically destroys lives because uh, once once you have a serious back injury, there's there's very difficult to go back to, to normal life without either you know opioids or or, or surgery. No, oh, and 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 there's a proverb in Marathi uh, uh, in India. Um, it says, "If your back isn't right, nothing is right." Thank you. Can't eat. You can't. Enjoy your spouse. You can't enjoy your kids. You, you're, you're, yeah. And because Western medicine has been like completely unable to figure this out, you know, we, and, and I'm, you know, I, I can say this because I'm an MD. I, I, I took care of people howling with back pain in the ER when I was a resident, and it doesn't reflect well on me or the people who trained me. But you know, we knew they were going to be fine. Nobody dies of back pain. Give them some opioids and get them out of the ER because they got gunshot wounds and car crashes coming. So you know these people. Yeah. And you know we tried not to be mean or dismissive, but it wasn't an interesting problem because we didn't understand it and we couldn't solve it. So we just papered it over with opioids, little realizing that if you introduce people to opioids, some percentage of them have just had their life ruined. Um, and I don't know if you all had the same rough ride with opioid addiction that we have in the United States, but that's another catastrophe. More people die of opioid overdoses in the United States than die of gunshot. Well, that's a terrible statistic. Yeah, it's it's yeah. No, I don't think we have the same sort of uh, to this scale. Uh, but I guess as far as as far as back pain. I've read some statistics from Health and Safety Executive here that 80%, 80% of people in the United Kingdom suffer from some sort of back pain. Uh, there's millions and millions of pounds spent on yeah, fixing, you know, covering people's ships because they're off, off sick. Um, I mean, I see it in, in my line of work and um, it's, it, 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 it's just terrible. And I've got a lot of friends who are like, <laughs> And unnecessary in places where people don't sit on these, um, you know, ergonomic chairs, um, they don't have back pain. You know, if you if you study, you know, hunter gatherer tribes like um, the Hadza in Tanzania, they don't have back pain because they don't have they don't have any furniture. You know, because they don't. You know, if they wish to take a restful posture, they squat. Which is um, turns out to be extremely advantageous for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, you don't have to like build furniture and drag it around as a hunter gatherer. That's kind of a non-starter. But also by squatting, you know, people balance over their ankles, so it's an active posture in the sense they're using muscular activity to stay balanced. And as a result, you know their insulin stays down. They're good. Like they, you know, the good cholesterol goes up, the bad cholesterol goes down. They're, they have much healthier um, circulatory systems and heart health and diabetes and all that stuff is unknown because they don't sit slumped with their muscles gone electrochemically dark hours a day because they're balanced over their ankle. The idea behind our chair is that, you know, we're not going to get back to squatting because. Thing. It isn't going to happen. But people can balance on their ischial tuberosities and their sitting bones, which similarly uses big muscles to stay balanced. You know, your internal external, 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 external,
are minimally active, but working constantly to keep you. Nobody's ever fallen asleep on one of our chairs, right? I mean, they, 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 they'll wake up on the floor. So all of your muscles are constantly active, which has profound um, implications for overall health. But we, you perhaps have heard of sitting disease, a topic that we didn't really start in on, but it's kind of this cluster of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and all-cause mortality. It's estimated that people who sit uh, eight or more hours a day lose, on average, two life years. Okay. That's that's terrible. Do you do you <clears throat> uh, are you familiar with the book Becoming a Supple Leopard by Kelly? Yeah. There you go. So I'm I'm a huge fan of Kelly, uh, and actually he I quote him very very often because he says that sitting is death, movement is life, and actually he gives a really good example of squatting. Uh, every time he's, he's got a client and he, he I think he specializes in sports therapy, sports physiotherapy, uh, helping people with sports injuries. He usually gives them a squatting test. He asks them to squat for 10 minutes. <laughs> well, but, but here's the thing. Every child can squat. Yeah. You, you watch a toddler and if they lose their balance, they drop to a squat effortlessly, perfectly. But that ability disappears. It doesn't disappear. It is stolen from by a chair. <laughs> when you force them to sit 90, 90, 90 all day long, you know, in school, you know, their their muscles contract, their tendons contract, and very shortly they are unable to squat. And squatting has been part of the human repertoire. We we know that squatting has been part of the human repertoire for millions of years. Um, you know, we just look at hunter gatherers, and this is this is what you see. But we also know when people stop squatting, because it turns out that when you squat, you push the tibia against the talus, and you leave a little indentation. So if you look at skeletons from uh, years gone by, you can tell if someone was a, spent time squatting or not. And it turns out in Europe, people stopped squatting between 16 and 1700, right about the time chairs came, chairs and benches and stuff came into being. So you know, we can see quite clearly written into the bony architecture of humans when we stopped doing what came naturally, squatting, and began this thing of sitting. Uh, and, and the thing is that sitting is intensely appealing. It's addictive, you know. When, when the, the folks who study the Hadza in Tanzania, the hunter-gatherer tribe, uh, you know, they, they just put out some chairs and the Hadza come, they say, like, 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 Bugs to the light, or like moths to to the, to the light at night, because these are hunter gatherer people, but the, but they love you know sitting in a chair just like the rest of us. You know, if the, if a Hadza moved to Manhattan, he's slouching in his chair just like everybody else. It's not that they're morally superior; it's just that they haven't discovered the catastrophe of our chairs. That's that. I mean, evolution is just extraordinary how and how we can manipulate it as well. Uh, it's it's crazy, but evolution protects us by giving us new abilities. But when some new threat comes on the horizon, you know, evolution can't move fast enough. So when sugar was discovered, you know, I, you may know this, but um, in the 1600s, they were like growing sugar in the Caribbean, and massive amounts were suddenly imported to Great Britain. The average Briton was eating over 200 pounds of sugar a year. That's a half a pound a day. And as you know, bees and, and all of their teeth fell out, you know, because it was a catastrophic discovery. People just love sugar to death, to, to their own death. You know? so sure. These experiences in the past where people discover something that's just not good for them, and it takes a while to, to get it under control. Sugar. Tobacco, you know, we went crazy for tobacco as a species, and it get that out of the, out of the culture. And well, a lot of people compare sitting to you, well, you smoking, right? And it's and it's and it's a pretty strict comparison in this sense. Everybody smoked, and it seemed normal. Doctors were smoking, and so the idea that smoking was somehow dangerous or wrong was inconceivable because 
everybody was smoking. Similarly, the idea that your chair is trying to kill you, um, if you say that sentence, it makes you sound like a, like a maniac because chairs are everywhere and everyone sits. What's wrong with you? Well, people have only been sitting for less than 100 years, you know? And it's, it's, it's a new thing. And frankly, it hasn't gone well. I think it's very, for human beings, it's very difficult to unlearn certain things. I mean, you gave example of smoking. Uh, I remember, because I'm, I'm, I'm into healthy eating as well, and, and I know that for many, many decades we were told by food industries that it's actually fats that cause all the diseases, not refined sugar and processed, uh, you know, food. But we know that it's actually, you know, it, it, it's sugars, these refined processed sugars that are the worst. Uh, but it, the change is very, very slow. And no, the change is very slow, at least in the United States, because the regulations that the government promulgates are largely driven by the sugar industry um, and the fast food industry. So it's been very, very hard to get good information um, into the population. And, and I have to say, um, when I was in medical school, I, in the 70s, um, I was excited that we were going to go a week-long course in nutrition because I thought, you know, this is, uh, but they just like told us the same old food pyramid junk that uh, with no real science behind it. Even as a medical student, I can say, you know, this is brain dead. No, nobody, uh, uh, well, they figured out that vitamins were important, you know, in the early 1900s, but, but uh, since then, really, it just kind of a way to you know, sell who the companies chose to make because it maximized their profits. It's, it's, really, it's really a very dispiriting story. Sugar was actually pitched as a great way to lose weight in the 1950s. <laughs> insane. It's insane. But hopefully, hopefully, things, things are, are improving. Because I, obviously, with social media, as much as I hate it, I mean, the information is, you know, disseminated so much quicker and people can do their own research now as well so a lot of my friends they they already know you know that fats are good some fats are actually really really good and important in your diet but stay away from refined sugar you know any sort of added sugar to your drinks you know coke soda cakes um, i know and, and one of my heroes in this is uh, this guy Paula, who has just three rules about food and they are eat food, not too much, and um, mostly vegetables. And and it covers a lot of ground because when he says food, he 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 defines that more strictly. He says food is something your grandmother would recognize as being food. Fruit fluffs. Are not food. Well, it's like yeah, that's not food. You know, oatmeal is food. Fruit roll-ups, no, and, and Coca-Cola is not food. Um, but but it's it's odd, you know. They, they put all this stuff into grocery stores, and un, unwitting people walk by and think it's in a grocery store. It must be food. So one of my partners, you know, well-educated guy, you know, went to an Ivy League school and and went to medical school and graduated from a great surgical residency, had a child with his wife. And his wife was a nurse, and they were so excited. And his wife comes home one day and finds him pouring Coca Cola into the baby bottle, preparing to feed it to the child. And you know, and she says, "Fred, that's not food." You know, and there was this confusion that because he bought a bottle of Coca Cola in a store, it was food. And even though he'd been to medical school, apparently he hadn't got the idea of what food is. So uh, the confusion, it, it, it's reasonable for people to be confused because the information hasn't been very well presented. Wow, that's shocking. <laughs> well, well, Fred was sort of a different person anyway, but still. <laughs> luckily, luckily, his wife Gigi was very smart and, and she, she, you know, she, she observed that the stupid gene is on the Y chromosome. <laughs> of course, of course she would say it. Uh, okay. So let's have a look at uh, at your chairs. Okay, so you've got a selection of, of several chairs. Can you just describe them briefly? And I'm really 
Well, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, intrigued with uh, with your uh, with your button chair, the whole concept, because I think it's it's genius the way you can manufacture it, how cheap it would be, the whole design. When I watched your TED talk, my my jaw dropped to to the floor. So could you could you go through uh, these chairs? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we, so we had the idea that if you could make a the, the seat pan of a chair, the thing that you sit on, just a little bit unstable. You know, let it tip five or maybe eight or maybe even nine degrees in any direction. In order to stay on top of it, you'd have to engage all of your core muscles. And because you're you're sitting on your ischial tuberosities, now, now you're balancing your whole spine on your ischial tuberosities. And if you were to... Um, If you look at the human pelvis, you'll see that you know this this is where the femur plugs in. This is where you this is where you stand on your femur. But just exactly from directly absolutely below it is the ischial tuberosity. So if you're if you're standing and you swing your femur out of the way, you know, this ischial tuberosity is exactly where you're designed to balance. So these two ischial tuberosities are really like the kickstand for the human body. This is where the human body is designed to land. And then you can use all of the spinal reflexes to keep everything balanced as it would have been if you were standing, only now your legs aren't in the way. And it turns out that people think walking is related to legs, but it's not. You, you don't actually need legs to walk. If you look just for a moment on YouTube, you can find a guy striding along perfectly well with no legs, and generally born with agenesis femurs. So he's walking, walking quite comfortably along on his ischial tuberosity. His steps are necessarily just a few inches long, but you watch and he walks quite comfortably with the balance, the poise, fine, which immediately tells you that walking has nothing to do with the legs because he's a man. It tells you that walking is something that happens with the pelvis and the spine. Well, if walking has to do with the pelvis and the spine, and you put people on an unstable chair, stand, well, now they can walk in the sense that their spine and their pelvis are perfectly free to walk. They just don't have to decide where to go. And because our chairs put people in this mode where they continue to walk, as far as their spine and their pelvis are concerned, which is really what walking is, um, they really never stop. And so I don't know if you've had this experience, almost everybody has, you doing your email for something or doing something with a spreadsheet for sure, and then you get up. And the first few steps are a matter of trying to you know, take your your disks from your a, a configuration of being wedges to being uh, disks. On our chairs, because people can walking the whole time. They just get up and walk away. Never stop walking. So that's really the deal, is that Hippocrates uh, observed 2,000 years ago, walking is man's best medicine. Uh, we could just, and this is what hunter-gatherers do. They walk 10 or even 15 miles a day. Walking is what we're designed for. Now we've got it down to way less than a mile a day. The results have been biochemically catastrophic. But if you can, people continue to walk while they're sitting, well, problem solved. This has been tried with things like um, treadmill desks, which have been <clears throat> sort of a catastrophic failure. Big, noisy, your office mates, you know, strangle you or, or poison your water bottle. Um, so, um, you know, something way more subtle that doesn't involve machinery or, or gears or pulleys or points. So, and that, that's kind of, kind of how our chairs do it, actually. Is. So we wanted to make a chair that would be unstable so people could be moving the whole time they're sitting. 
but we want it to be so inexpensive everybody can have one. And there are other kind of tippy chairs out there in the world, but they, they tend to be quite expensive. So, you know, I and I, I don't have any design shops or, or a design store or any of that, but I had an idea. And so I, I went to a, um, a makerspace here in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and I met a couple of guys who had real design experience. They trained in uh, Pratt in New York City and worked in the city for many years. And, and, and they could see that I had an idea uh, and that I was hopeless. So they said, Doctor, let us help you. And, um, and I said, well, you know, you don't understand. We have to make these things so cheap that anybody can have them. And they said, we're in. You know, they, they, they just were just, you know, that kind of people. And we attracted a small cadre of people with you know, that the, the shared the vision. And so um, it wasn't the first thing we came up with, but you know, ultimately um, I stumbled on this shape. Um, you know, it's, it's a little hard to describe. Um, it's a little, and it's almost impossible to draw. And it's hard to take a picture of. But what it is is the volume of intersection of two cylinders at right angles. Uh, it would be where my so it's the volume of intersection of two cylinders at right angles with non-coincident axes and possibly different radii. Um, and the thing that makes it useful is if you put it on a surface, it'll rock. If you put another surface on top of that, it'll rock. But because they're 90 degrees opposed, you put it between two flat surfaces and it rocks in every direction. And so you get omnidirectional rocking out of a shape. And you know, we, this is like we injection mold these five miles from here in Milton, Vermont. Um, it's, it's made out of polycarbonate. And um, you know, because the mold to make something out of polycarbonate is very expensive, we, we had to uh, make sure that the two pieces that make this thing were identical. So um, as I say, this, this shape wasn't the first thing we thought of. And when we first came up with it, we were cutting them out of wood with a bandsaw. And, you know, I was really terrified that we were going to have a bad outcome. Because I was on the replant team at the hospital, I know what's involved in putting fingers back. And it's never quite the same. So, so anyway, we, we jumped into uh, injection molding these things, and then you know, we can make as many as we want. And so um, that's what we've been doing: you know, we're making these things, and then we you know, put them in. And then, and then, of course, the other thing, the reason having these design guys on the team was so important was because you know, they understood that it's not enough for it to work. It's not even enough for it to work at a price point that's terrific. It has to not only it has to also not be so ugly no one wants it. And so um, you know these guys are good at that kind of stuff. And so we actually won a design award from uh, from a design contest in, in Europe um, uh, in 2020. Um, so you know that was okay fine. And now we rang all the bells. You know, it works. It's inexpensive. And it's not so ugly, nobody wants. So um, it's actually it's actually pretty attractive when you compare it to different, let's say, European competitors' active ergonomic chairs. It looks really, really beautiful. Uh, but I, I'm just I'm just blown away with 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 the button chair. I was going to talk about the the button chair. So so. Um, and I, so anyway, I was I was like pitching these ideas to um, uh, chair companies, steel case and companies like that at a at Neocon, a big office chair convention in Chicago every year in the United States. And I got as far as a vice president, and she kind of shook her head and said, "No, no adult will sit on." And, th and that was like she's made a decision for millions of people who buy chairs from this big company. And I thought, you know. That's very. That's a very helpful thing for her to say because you know, suddenly it came clear to me that oh, Linus Pauling, you know, got a Nobel Prize for physics back at the turn of the last century, and he famously said, "Science proceeds one funeral at a time." You know, kind of a morbid uh, way of thinking of things, but by that he meant. Some people just can't change their way of thinking, and the only way to make progress is to wait for them to die. Um, and not that you have to like speed it along or anything, but this you should get used to this idea. So 
I thought, okay, fine. If we can't talk grown-ups in this, we need another group of people that are more open to new ideas, you know, like kids. So, um, but then, you know, kids don't buy chairs, and, you know, the schools, at least in the United States, don't have money to buy chairs. They can hardly afford glitter for a preschooler's art project. So, okay, fine, we'll just have to make one that's like a chair for kids that moves, that's really inexpensive. How how about free? Let's go for free. So, um, you know, we, we came up with the idea that if you could make a chair out of plywood and you could have a CNC router that you just like stamp out the pieces like a cookie cutter and then have the pieces fit together and lock together with self-locking joints, you could just like assemble a chair by putting a piece of plywood on a CNC router, cut the pieces and then fit them together. You still needed a way to, to, to let the seat move. And for that, we had the idea that Old tennis balls. Huh? Old tennis balls are cheaper than free because people will pay you to take them. Away. So, yeah, so, okay, fine. So we'll put a tennis ball, and so you um, wind up with something that looks like this. Um, um, a chair that can move because it's sitting on a ball. And uh, and the pieces, you know, four pieces made out of plywood, they fit together, but uh, there's a self-locking joint hidden in here that you can't see, and then there's these kind of Joints that, like the like the clip that does the yeah. your backpack. And we just made it out of wood. And wood is springy enough that it locks together quite soundly. It's very very solid. But you can take it apart if you beat on it with a rubber mallet if you ever wanted to. Um, people wanted it to be adjustable, and said, "Okay, fine. Well, if you want a shorter chair? Just cut off some of the legs." You know, they're going for inexpensive because you. But kids' chair is adjustable anyway, and you'd only adjust it once. And if you want a bigger one, you'll make another one. They're, they're, they're basically. So um, so we, we put a bunch of these in uh, some schools here in Burlington, Vermont, and went back to check you know, several weeks later. And the kids had worn holes in the tennis ball. So you know, they're obviously using them a lot because well, they know they need to move. You know, when somebody tells them to sit still, they know that's a stupid idea. You know? And they should be saying to their Elders, you know, no, no, you should be moving, and the kids would be right because they're Absolutely. their DNA. They, they, they know what's going on. But anyway, we, we had to replace the tennis balls with lacrosse balls. They're made out of solid rubber. And those little beggars can't wear them. Out. <laughs> but you know what? It, it's one of these genius ideas that could smile on your face. It, it, it's just fantastic. And uh, I have to say, I haven't seen your chairs anywhere here in Europe? Well, we, uh, we've, uh, we've sent chairs to Europe, or we've sent chairs to 25 different countries. Um, but so far, we're just like firing them out of Burlington, Vermont. Um, you know, we ship them anywhere in the world. We've, you know, we've got them in Austria and Australia and Taiwan and Korea and UK and all over Europe. Um, just onesies. You know, we, we, we don't have any distributors, right? although we're kind of trying to figure out how to do that. We don't exactly know how to. Yeah, I'm a washed up trauma surgeon. <laughs> so, 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 um, but I, I think, I think we're going to find a partner in the UK who can like figure out that part of it for us. It was just like, you know, ship them a container of chairs. And make it <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that well. I know that would be fantastic because I know that schools here they would they would love it. Well, the the, the button chair, but I was going to suggest suggest to you because you you mentioned these sort of conferences for ergonomists. Uh, I go to these all the time. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a member of an organization called National Back Exchange, and it's it's I think it's the biggest organization uh, putting together. OTs, physios, ergonomists, uh, moving and handling specialists, and they meet once a year. It's a, it's a it's basically an organization who advises government on certain policies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they they have conference every September. Mm -hmm. and, it I'm, might, and, I'm, and it might even happen this year if people get vaccinated soon enough. Yes. Well, we I think we've crossed 25 million uh with first dose in the uk congratulations so we are doing really well i had my first dose and i think i will have my second dose in the next week or two 
So um, it, it, it's great. I mean, the NHS is amazing. It's, they're, they're heroes, you know. Our our um, our NIH, um, you know, was hobbled, but also had some stumbles. So um, we haven't done so well, but we're we're doing better now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know. Yeah. So I I was gonna I was gonna su suggest that uh, I, I might I might even give you a hand setting up a little stall with with chairs. If you could send oh, yeah. some some promotional uh, materials, maybe a banner booklets because uh, they would be they would be uh, I think they would be really really up for, for something as, like that. As, you, as you've experienced you know it's hard to explain to somebody what's going on here but as soon as you sit on it you kind of get it um, and um, and I've done this experiment many many times because on a sunny day when it's warm in Burlington Vermont we put out some chairs on on a walking street in Burlington just to see what will happen you know People come by and sit on them, and you know they lose their balance for a second, and then they get organized, and then just within within about a minute or maybe two minutes, you know, they're starting to get up and head back, and you know their their head balances on C one C two, the atlas axis. Now, very shortly, they're sitting with basically without anybody you know yelling at them or instructing them or shaming them or giving them a video to watch or making them you know memorize. Because your spine knows what to do with gravity, right? You, you, as a toddler, you spent a year, most of a year, going from creeping to crawling to toddling to walking. And during that year, you were growing synapses at 100,000 a second. You know, your nervous system is like just exploding inside. And so you're able to like master the very, very difficult thing of walking upright in gravity. I mean, you watch, and it's very hard to get a robot to do this, right? It's very, very elegant. Once you've got it, you got it. And so if you put a unstable seat pan under something, their spine remembers exactly how to work in gravity. If you get rid of the bad cues that are coming from the backrest, the headrest, and the footrest, and the lumbar support, you know, now your spine is like the sixes and sevens. You know, it, it, it's just like trapped. But if you get rid of all that stuff and just let your spine have a silent conversation with gravity, all the spinal reflexes that you spent a year carefully programmed spring into action. And now your posture is perfect and you can like interact with the spreadsheet or email or whatever. And your, your brain can listen into it and play with it, but it's not necessary. Your spine can handle all of the details on its own and leave your cortex free to, you know, do email. Yeah. When I when I unboxed it, well, first of all, it's it's very light, which is a, a massive benefit because majority of ergonomic ergonomic chairs are quite heavy and bulky with you know massive bases. So when I when I opened it, you know, it took me literally thirty seconds to put together. It it was so easy, and when I sat on it for the first time. I have to say it was a very unique sensation because you know to be sitting on something that forces your core to, to be engaged, move your muscles. Uh, but I have to say I got used to it literally within ten seconds, and uh, I, I I felt great. Right? No, it's it's kind of like floating, you know. And and I, I get bored pretty easily. You know, I've burned through several careers, and I'm you know still still at it. This is this has been uh, I'm I'm still amused every time I sit down on one of our chairs, and and more than that, when I sit down on like a normal chair that doesn't move, you know, it feels like something's wrong. You know, you're, what is wrong? Oh, right. Yeah. So so um, you know so epidemiology is one of the things that uh, is in my portfolio, and I, I studied with a. One of the masters of epidemiology, uh, Dr. Sue Baker at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Johns so Hopkins University in Baltimore. And Sue taught us all that uh, you can't blame people or shame people or harangue them into behaving in ways that are better for them. You must change their environment so that they can't behave. You know, yelling at people not to drive drunk, okay, fine, you, good luck with that. But if you put a divider down the middle of the highway, people can't hit each other head on anymore. If you put airbags in the car, they've got a place to put their face when they do something uh, 
silly. Just so if we can get rid of bad chairs, just once, just put a good chair in somebody's office now, every day, you know, they're going to get this time, is going to exercise, and their biochemistry is going to be much better off for it. And you, it's not like running or, or going to the gym where you have to make the decision every day. You just have to make this decision once. Put a better chair in people's office, and suddenly every day will be better. Absolutely. And you can, if you can, you know, save someone from back injury. I mean, what what more would you want from your uh, invention? Right. No. And and as a doctor, you know, trying to take care of people who are already sick, you know, you're you're starting way behind the the start post. You know, what you want is you want to keep people from becoming ill. As a surgeon, you know, you can operate on maybe five or maybe ten thousand people in a group. That's it. You can only operate on people one at a time. You get them into the ICU and out again. Whatever. As an epidemiologist. You can affect hundreds of millions of lives. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, what what does the future hold for for Core Three Hundred and Sixty? Uh, are you extending the range of your chairs, or are you coming up with something different? Right. No. So, um, you know, our our uh, mandate is to like make these things so inexpensive anybody can have one. So right now we're you know, making everything in, in the United States where, you know, it's not cheap to manufacture stuff. Anybody who wants to make anything goes to China. We don't want to do that. So, okay, fine, we'll just go back to the well and we're, we'll do some designs that um, are even simpler than, I mean, it's hard to get much simpler than this, but we're working on designs that are even simpler. And um, but we're hoping to like introduce another chair that would be even less expensive. We're getting close, you know, but um, you know we have to like plan a lot to be sure that you know we've got all the bugs worked out. So it's 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 still six months or a year away. But um, you know the, the idea is just to keep making better, less expensive chairs so that everybody. You know, the goal is, I, I love this. Um, Edison is given credit for, and. Um, it was quite expensive because they were making the filament out of carbon fiber that was made out of bamboo and this and that. And, and uh, somebody turned to him and said, so what, what good is this? You know, only it's so expensive. Edison said, you know, I plan for light bulbs to be so cheap that only the rich will have candles. I love that. I love that. So our, our plan is to make active sitting so inexpensive that Everybody. Well, I think it's already. No, it's already way cheaper than you may know that you know these these la di da ergonomic chairs that you, you can spend three or four or five thousand dollars for. You know, it's it's breathtaking because they're all the same. You know, they yeah. just have more chrome and more leather and, and charge higher prices, so people will feel like they you know because you you find people with back pain and they're willing to do anything. And the unspoken assumption is if I just spend enough money, I will feel better. This is not true. You can spend more money, but you get the same chair. Um, you know, what you need is a different chair. And there aren't very many of them out there. And of course, I bought all the active chairs on the market. Just, and every time I get one in the mail, you know, I open it with my heart in my throat because I'm, maybe somebody's got a better answer than we do. You know, and, and, uh, I will have wasted five years of my life. But, Every time I open the front row, you know, ours is like either better or cheaper or both. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I, but I still, I still look at all of these things because uh, you know, the, the field is still developing. Um, but we're a long way. To yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't come across anything even close to to your chair. Well, there's a great chair that comes out of Germany, a company called Mishu, M-I-S-H-U, um, that I love, but their rocker is made out of wood. And so their chair is quite expensive because it's, there's a lot of wood that goes into it. Um, but recently we, we started sharing our rockers with them. So now they can have a less expensive version of their chair. <laughs> That's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll penetrate the market any way I can, you know, just to help get more active chairs and more people. And you know, companies that want to partner is a terrific way to kind of expand the reach of the city. Because 
you know, really the market is so large, there can't be enough people to fill it. You know, I'll be dead before we before we get there. Oh, absolutely. Especially, you know, these days. Do you, know we, we... Chairs, do you know how many chairs there are? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's been estimated there are 70 chairs for every American. Now, how's that even possible? Go look at your house. You know, there's all those kitchen chairs and the dining room chairs and the chairs and the, all those chairs that are waiting for the next funeral or wedding and all the chairs at school. I mean, there are a lot of chairs on it. It's going to take a long time to replace them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been an, an amazing hour and 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was so enlightening so uh i i really appreciate your time uh so uh all your chairs are available on uh core 360. Like we have we have two websites we have one q as in queen q o r 360.com that's where we like have adult stuff but we also have another website button chairs b u t t o n c h a i r s dot org where we give away the designs for our button share that anybody wants to download it. Plans have been downloaded over 2,000 times all over the world. So um, I think we're getting way faster penetrance by giving stuff away than by selling it. <laughs> Fantastic. So what I'll do, I'll add all of these, uh, all of this information uh, in the description of, of, uh, of the YouTube video. And obviously I'll send you the link so you can, you can approve it as well. Oh no, I'm, I'm sure I'll love it. <laughs> this has been terrific. Thank you so much. You know, I, oh. it's this is the kind of thing that, that keeps me going. Is that you know, other other people are almost as nutty as I am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, and I'm sure we'll be we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks so much.